Hi everyone. For most of us, Spring Boot has become the go-to for creating any new framework or microservices within our ecosystem. Spring Boot as a framework evolved a lot in the last few years and we have a lot of best practices which we can leverage to make our applications easily maintainable, scalable and flexible. In this video, I'll be sharing some of my best practices which I've been using for creating production geared Spring Boot applications. Let's get started. Press the bell icon on the YouTube app and never miss any update from Tech Primers. So the first and the foremost is the Spring Initializer. In most of my videos, I start with start.spring.io. So that's where we start off. The easy way to start is using start.spring.io or you can use the Spring Initializer IntelliJ plugin or you can use the CLI as well. Why we are leveraging this particular tool is to make sure we are getting the same versions and we are following the same best practices whatever we add in the pom.xml because when we add manual dependencies within pom we might end up adding older versions when we copy paste from some other sources right and also the version numbers can get messed up with so if we leverage start.spring.io we will be able to get the standard versions and we can leverage the existing versions which are there in the spring cloud dependencies or spring boot dependencies and you can use your application with all these dependencies out of the box with a cleaner configurations in the POM XML. So that is one reason we will leverage Spring Initializer for creating our applications. The second one is leveraging the Open API specification or Swagger. Earlier it used to be called as Swagger. With Swagger 3.0, it's called as Open API specification. And Swagger has come up with something called Swagger Hub using which you can post your Open API specification and generate code out of it. You can leverage different Maven plugins for that too. So I would definitely like you to leverage the open API specification for creating any new API and for creating code out of these specification, you can definitely leverage the error codes, the response types, your objects, entities, etc. So that all these are all standardized and you don't have to code it manually. The next one is using the auto configurations. Auto configurations let Spring Boot know what it needs when the application starts up. This will help Spring Boot to fasten your boot up time and also configure your Spring Boot application so that it can serve you better when there are some configuration or maybe dependency specific tasks. So definitely leverage Spring Boot's auto configuration instead of manually injecting or intercepting any requests. The fourth one is using constructor injection instead of using the at auto wired annotation. Using constructor injection creates a best code practice because when you have more classes to be injected, you know that the classes need to be split because when let's say there are more than five uh, classes to be injected, then you realize this class is going to perform a lot of different tasks and it might be huge. So you might have to split that up. If you use auto wired injection, then you might not be aware that there are so many classes to be injected and then the code doesn't look great. So using auto wire you might end up creating a lot of spring specific dependencies and also a huge bloated class. Use construction injection to make the code clean and also leverage springs auto wiring out of the box without using the at auto wire injection. The fifth one is creating modular code where you can have controllers present in the controller folder and services present in the services folder. You can also create functionality specific or feature specific modules or folders based on your requirement. This type of a model helps you in identifying where your files reside and what kind of functionality they support. This is another good practice to create modular code bases so that it can scale well. And it makes the navigation very easy for developers to go through the code. The sixth one is using entities or data transfer objects. Leveraging these data transfer objects will help you in creating a structure to the response or the objects which you use within the Spring Boot application instead of returning hash maps or plain old objects. Creating entities and data transfer objects help you create these standards. Like I mentioned earlier, if you have used open API specification, the data transfer objects also can be enforced as a part of the same standard. But using DTOs will make your code clean and it can help you in accidental code damages. The seventh one is leveraging the bean validations. There are a lot of annotations with respect to validating your beans. You can have at max age 
or at integer or at string and you can restrict the number of characters all these kind of annotations can be added into your data transfer objects and make your code clean and also you don't have to have custom validations in your code if there is any validation which needs to be performed because most of the time when you're exposing apis you are vulnerable to some data which could create issues you might use custom validations but leveraging some bean validations will help you reduce the code and also keep your code clean because there are out of the box features which are provided by spring and the validation api which you can leverage the next one is externalizing your configurations most of the time we have development environments or the production environment specific configurations these could be injected dynamically or maybe it could be injected from an external source this could be maybe from the platform you could leverage for example in kubernetes you could have injected things via config maps or maybe in aws you could have injected it via maybe secrets manager or whichever service which fits in this will help us reduce the dependency of the code so you don't have to manipulate the code by checking some configurations so you can externalize these configurations so that you don't have to repackage them and you can change them dynamically whenever you want the ninth one is creating logging standards across your microservices this will help you in navigating through your logs when you are tracing your logs across microservices when you move from one microservice to other you should know that the logging standards are standard and it should be pretty much the same across these microservices or else it will create confusion in terms of navigating your code base and also your logs hence creating a common standard and using the same log4j or logback xmls across your microservices makes sense to create a standardization within your microservices architecture the 10th one is exposing your health check endpoints these could help the platform to assess what's happening to your application and it might restart your application when it requires for example in terms of kubernetes you can expose liveness and readiness probes so that your application can be scaled very well by integrating these terminologies within the platform and it can leverage the liveness and the readiness probes to auto scale and make your application more resilient when it needs to scale well one thing i have burnt my hands with is exceptions using a common or a framework level exception makes sense because when somebody requests for an api call and your application is not able to process most of the time we return 500 internal error using that 500 internal error it's not going to help both us and also the client in terms of debugging issues using a interceptor to identify what issues are present within the application logging them and also translating that to a meaningful information will be useful for debugging our issues within our application so always intercept exceptions in terms of exception handlers so if there is any exception within the application due to some unknown reasons it could be null pointer it could be something specific to hash maps or whatever return a proper response to the client that way we don't have to expose the errors which are happening within the application to our consuming applications always test your spring boot application by isolating your flow or else it's going to be huge because most of the time we are creating Spring Boot applications with end-to-end -end flows and multiple API calls, but creating a single test for everything is not going to help. So isolate your flows or features specific to your feature-specific flows by leveraging Cucumber or maybe specification tests and create tests individually for integrating all your modules within the same application and test only those. And automate them as a part of your CI CD pipeline so that way you get to know the feedbacks whenever you are committing your code. The next major one is adding unnecessary dependencies. Do not add unnecessary dependencies because already there are a lot of jars inside the Spring Boot application which can slow down the startup process, which can also have other dependency issues or maybe runtime issues in terms of class loading, etc. So make sure you're adding the right versions of your dependencies and don't add unnecessary dependencies. If you don't know what they are for, don't add them. So make sure you know why you're adding those dependencies and then reduce the size of your dependencies to make your application perform faster. If you're concerned about the startup time, you can leverage something called as lazy initialization. You can load your classes whenever a request comes in or whenever your classes or your flows are getting triggered. You can leverage lazy initialization for it or you can leverage the spring native library which has been recently launched and it's been in the experimental phase. So you can give both a try. So Spring Lazy initialization has been in production for a long time, so you can leverage that. 
or if you're using your application for serverless workloads or your startup time needs to be much faster in terms of scaling your applications then you can definitely leverage spring native for that the last one the final one is leveraging reactive calls whenever it is required or whenever you can this will help improve your application speed because you might not be idle in terms of waiting for io operations for doing dependency calls or reading files etc leverage reactive api calls so that you can have productive usage of your threads and you can get callbacks whenever you need to process messages from the external source this will help reduce the idle time for your application and make your application look faster those are some of the best practices which i have been following and i feel you should also leverage them do let me know if i missed anything in the comment section below as always if you like the video go and like it if you haven't subscribed to the channel go and subscribe to it meet you again in the next video thank you very much